Maybe he's leaving his wife. I don't know. I don't care. Lots of people have knives and saws and ropes around their houses. And lots of men don't speak to their wives all day. Lots of wives nag and men hate them and trouble starts. But very, very few of them end up in murder, if that's what you think. Uh, it's pretty hard for you to keep away from that word, isn't it? Sequel. Re re reboot. Which one will it be? It's the Ruined Child of Podcast. Greetings, Starfighters. Thank you for tuning in to Ruined Childhoods. Whether you're a subscriber or maybe you saw a podcast talking about uh, our movie for this episode, Rear Window, we're glad that you're listening. And uh, my name's Dan. And with me, as always, is John. How's it going, John? Things are pretty good, Dan. How are you? I am, as Joe Cocker would say, feeling all right. Okay. It's been a really uh, busy and crazy week. We're recording this here. It is Saturday, February 18th, and uh, it's just been, you know, we're we're kind of coming off a uh, busy week here uh, over on my end of things up here in Seattle. And uh, yeah, and how's your week been? Pretty good. I've been, you know, very busy with work. I mean, I'm sure that anybody who subscribes or listens to this podcast regularly notices that we've gone from like doing this every week to uh, I guess this past year really uh, spacing out the episodes a little bit more and that's just because we've both gotten re- like busier schedules and we appreciate uh, patience if you're somebody who actually looks forward to this kind of a thing but uh, yeah I-, I think that there's a uh, a lot of of good stuff going on, and we're really excited that we get to do this uh, as frequently as we are able to do it. Yeah, and uh, you know, Dan, there's there's a few things that I wanted to talk about right off the bat. Um, you know, we are a podcast that talks about movies, mostly cult and classic movies, and then we, uh, you know, essentially. Uh, spew out what we think we would want to do if we had the opportunity to bring this back as some sort of, you know, new property. And uh, we have shown a lot of respect for, I'd say, uh, one of these things I'm about to mention is something that we've talked about over the course of the entire, you know, run of the podcast. And that is uh, our respect for the the acting of uh, action star Bruce Willis. And I just wanted to uh, wish uh, him and his family a an easy time during uh, his, uh, you know, he was recently diagnosed with uh, a form of dementia. And I just wanted to acknowledge that, you know, Bruce Willis has done so much for us as, uh, you know, movie viewers and, uh, you know, for those who enjoyed um uh, moonlighting uh television viewers as well and uh you know we are such big fans of the die hard franchise and die hard wouldn't be what it is without bruce willis so just mad respect to bruce willis that's really all i have to say yeah um you know agree there and you know uh as this is, is such a difficult thing to to go through uh and uh, you know really challenging time for for Bruce Willis and his his family but i think you know being able to kind of celebrate his career and yeah. you know what and it, it it feels like there are and and i think you know over the last year we've kind of we've known you know okay this is sure, we, yeah. we've seen the last uh you know kind of big uh, Hollywood Bruce Willis movie, or you know, we've seen the last Bruce Willis movie, really, aside from those ones that he pops up in, and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But anyway, uh, so mad respect, mad respect for him, mad yeah. respect for Judy Dench, who has her eyesight, her vision is gone. So, so yeah. And that's another thing that I feel like has come up a, a lot over the the past few years since you know she stepped down from the Bond series. Uh, yeah, um, it's it's sad, and I think that you know 
at, for her, it's, you know, making the right calls to prioritize her health. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, eventually people do re- retire. <laughs> so, yeah. but, you know, uh, the, the just thinking about, uh, you know, about pe- people who've, who've made our lives a little bit better. We hope that they're, that there's something making their lives a little bit better, especially during these trying times. Yeah. And uh, something that we've been talking about uh, a lot recently over the past few months, uh, you know, we're, uh, well, Dan, I don't remember if you finished the movie, but last time we spoke, you had watched uh, some of uh, the movie White Noise, but I know you had already read I, the book. I and, did finish it, yes. Uh, Dan, have you heard what's been going on in the news lately in East Palestine, Ohio? Yes. Okay, so for anybody who's unaware, the movie and book, I, well, I, I'm going to talk about specifically the movie because... It, it was it's a filmed close enough there. adaptation. It was so, well, yeah. but also the movie was filmed in and had a lot of uh, extras from East Palestine, Ohio. Oh, and the movie takes place, I think, as, you know, essentially there. Uh, and the movie is a, or I guess, an inciting incident of the movie is that there is a train that crashes into, or a train that crashes that releases. Uh, chemicals into the air, creating an airborne toxic event that has forced this uh, town to uh, evacuate. And that in real life just happened in East Palestine, Ohio. And uh, it's been a real difficult time for the residents in that area and the surrounding areas. And it is uh, an absolutely bonkers coincidence. And if anybody is listening from that area, we hope that everybody's doing okay. And, um, wow, what a strange thing to happen. You know, to, to quote the, uh, late nineties pop act OMC, how bizarre, how bizarre, how bizarre. <laughs> uh yes not to make light of a very serious situation I, but no 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 yes. but it's, seriously though it's it is very uh just bizarre that it is very tra- it's very tragic that it happened it is very bizarre where and when it happened a- absolutely yeah. yeah absolutely um right um, but Dan, I, I'm also wondering, I know you've been really busy, uh, wondering if you've had a chance to watch any movies lately, whether they be new or old. Oh, okay. So yes, <laughs> I watched Sing Street. Now, of course I did not watch it in all, all in one sitting. Sing Street. Are you not familiar with Sing Street? I love Sing Street. Oh, you've seen? Okay. So yeah, I wasn't sure if, if it was something you had seen before, but I finally, you know, like had the moment where it was like, okay, let me check this movie out. I don't know much more other than that. Like it's kind of a musical and it's set in, in the eighties. And it's like, I knew it took place in the United Kingdom. I right. don't think I knew. It's in it Dublin. In Dublin. Right. Yeah. Which, yeah. Um, uh, which, which makes perfect sense. And uh, it, it is such a charming movie. It is one of those movies where it's set in the 80s, but it doesn't feel like it's overly 80s up. It's right. like it just feels like it might have been made then as well, in a way. Except where it is 80s up, I like it because it feels like there's a point to it. Cause so so it, if I can, I mean, I don't think I'm really giving much away, but, you know, basically the protagonist who's 15 yeah. Uh, yeah, starts a band to Im- impress this girl, and it he's going off of his musical inspirations, which primarily come from his older brother, right? And what whatever his brother is listening to, and it goes from like I'm trying to remember some of the stuff that he plays, but. Well, we, there's like, you know, new wave stuff. Like there's like Duran Duran, Duran, Duran. The Cure. Like yeah. there's, you know, a lot of those different types of influences. But with every, with every different, you know, kind of subgenre that he gets into, like the band's next song 
right. kind of has that flavor. It's not a ripoff, but no, it has no, that no. flavor. No, and you know, in the ways that it is kind of 80s, it's not 80s in the sense where it's just like eye rolly. I mean, even though right. like, even with the the music styles that change, uh the main characters like personal style changes. Yes, yes. And I like how it's not like perfect or anything. It's very, you know, what he can put together with what he's got because he's not from an affluent family and he's just kind of like trying to find his own identity when well, he's as living he's in, going through this journey in very, you know, blue collar yeah. Dublin. Uh he's getting picked on by the school bully, which I I'm not going to say anything more about that, but just a satisfying the, resolution to that. The cast story is excellent they are you know with the exception of a few of the you know older actors it's a lot of people who you wouldn't really recognize from anything and i think that that really plays in its favor yeah and i it's it's a really charming movie with really great music uh it's the same director who did once and has done like a lot of other like you know music kind of movies and uh, it, it has I, it, it has that vibe. That it has that vibe, vibe to it. And uh, I also want to point out, and it's it's. I'm glad that you brought up this movie because I I love this movie. I I saw it um a, f- a few years ago, and then it came back on like Netflix or something not too long ago. And so I was watching it, and uh, I have a friend who also likes it. And you know, sometimes when we're you know, texting each other. It's just like, hey, what are you up to? And we'll go like, oh, just rabbit stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Which if you've seen the movie, you, yeah, rabbit you, you stuff. get it. Yes. yes. <laughs> rabbit yes. stuff. Yes. Yeah. So I uh, love that. Love that. So I'm glad that you brought that up. What a, isn't it such just like a charming movie that's just like, it's so good to just put on when you're, you know, just wanting something that's just like a little bit of a, a mood elevator. It's very pleasant. There's definitely some substance to it. It's yeah. not just uh, fluff, but it, it, I think it's got the right balance to it. And it's a really uh, just, uh, you know, charming, charming story and a charming film. Yeah. Uh, so there's so there's that. And oh, man, what else did I? Br- I know it's been a few weeks and I know I mentioned it to you specifically, but I don't know that I've mentioned it on any of our recent episodes. But I did happen to watch uh, recently The Stranger uh, at, directed by and co-starring Orson Welles. Oh, OK. Yeah. 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 yeah so uh, forgive me if I've mentioned this already, but. It's a movie that's been on my, you know, just kind of like on my radar for for quite some time, and uh, and it's one of those that's just always streaming on I mean, like Hoopla or Canopy or it's. I think I watched it on Prime, but it's you know always just kind of around, and it's Orson yeah. Welles plays a, a a New England college professor who is in reality an escaped Nazi who's hiding out Mm, in America. Yeah. And they're enacting a plan. And uh, the person who's after him and, oh my, I can't believe the actors, uh, Edward G. Robinson. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Edward G. Robinson is the, like, government agent who's, like, hunting him down and has come to the town, the college town, and is is you know kind of getting his evidence together and it is such a it it is a really good movie <laughs> it, it, like yeah i think i've seen it like years ago but i don't remember too much about it but yeah i kind of want to watch it again it is i mean you know orson welles as and i i also uh not too long ago finished watching the documentary on about Orson Welles and about his making uh, uh, The Other Side of the Wind. So yeah. the documentary is called They'll Love Me When I'm Dead on Netflix. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just, I find that, I find those documentaries about filmmakers, especially filmmakers pre, let's say, like pre 21st century, we'll just say 20, 20th century filmmakers. Sure. Uh-huh. They're just, uh, you know, fascinating, and uh, it's 
it, you know, really led me to say like, ah, you know, I really should see some more of his work. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I think it's always really important to kind of revisit some of the classics. And uh, if there are ones that are from these kind of pivotal uh, creators, such as Orson Welles, it's, it makes a lot of sense to to take a look at those. And it really makes you think about the things that you're watching now and how much of it comes from those early creators. Right. Well, and and I feel like this is a a great segue into our episode. I was going to I, I was like, "Ah, oh, I had another thing I was going to bring up." Uh, but no, such a good segue to our episode next time. Next time. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah, we're talking about Rear Window. Uh, you know, this is the second Hitchcock movie that we're devoting an episode to, certainly not that we've talked about. But, uh, yeah, uh, we talked about Vertigo, another uh, collaboration with James Stewart, and uh, Rear Window uh, from 1954, I believe, mm-hmm. right? 54? Yeah. yeah um, I mean, absolutely iconic. I mean, before we even get to anything else, I've you know – we would typically talk about this towards the end, but you know, this has been parodied so many times for TV shows. I think Roseanne did an episode and the Simpsons had an episode and there was just like, there's all these uh, like, you know, parodies of this, uh, of this movie specifically. I mean, this is a, I, uh, a story that you can really do in a lot of different ways, but uh, rear window very specifically has such iconic moments to them. Sorry, my dogs are next to me and, uh, maybe making some noise in a second, but, uh, yeah, I just love the way that, uh, Hitchcock built this, like literally built this world, <laughs> you know, he, he created well, yeah. this, uh, such an iconic vision for this, you know, New York city, life uh yes. just from the perspective of one window and it's yeah it's a really clever thrilling uh way of just like you know putting yourself into that position of like you know well what do i think about the world around me without actually knowing these people that i you know maybe i even share an address with them and i don't even know them not me we, or you. We live in houses, but uh, <laughs> but you know, well, Dan, although he doesn't, he he doesn't because uh, it, it reminded something recent that it very much called to mind is only murders in the building. Oh yeah 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 yeah. But it's funny because he actually, I there's no mention of I think anyone that lives in his building. True. Well, you can't <laughs> see them from his window, right? Well, Dan, I I. I'm trying to think. That's well, my you, alternate version. It's somebody yeah. sitting on the other side who's got an injury, and they're and they're watching out 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 their window, and they see Jimmy Stewart. And, yeah, yeah. Well, what's uh, what worked so well in Only Murders in the Building is that it is kind of this. If it's like a U shaped, or maybe even like a like a square with a courtyard in the center. Yeah. So yeah. like, you know, you're in the same building, but you can see different neighbors through your window. And that plays into, I, I think the first season, especially. Um, but why don't I do a little synopsis of this one? And uh, for anybody who isn't familiar with rear window. Uh, yeah. Here we go. Uh, when you're holed up for weeks on end with a bum leg in 1950s, New York city, your activity options can be pretty limited. For photojournalist L.B. Jeffries, a.k.a. Jeff, no world is more fascinating after weeks of isolation than the one outside his window. The courtyard behind his apartment building has a full cast of characters, each with their own stories, or at least what Jeff can only assume. But what he doesn't realize is the full story taking place inside his own home, a man constantly looking for intrigue, ignoring the soap opera of his own life, specifically when it comes to his neglected girlfriend Lisa. And life becomes even more intriguing for Jeff when one of the characters in his reality TV window goes missing, leading Jeff to suspect that she's been murdered and disposed of by her philandering husband. The more involved he gets, the better he is at convincing Lisa and his his caretaker Stella to get involved, potentially putting both of their lives at risk. So uh, I'll just do a quick uh cast list here so jimmy stewart is jeff grace kelly is 
incredible as Lisa. Uh, I mentioned Stella, who's played by Thelma Ritter. Uh, we have his friend, who's a detective, played by Wendell Corey. Um, we have Lars Thorwald, which is who is played by Raymond Burr, and he is the the suspect, the one who is being suspected of murdering his wife, uh, and uh, his, his wife, played by Irene Winston. We have some other characters in this uh, this scenario. There's the woman who lives on the first floor, uh, Miss Lonely Hearts. That's Judith Evans. Uh, there's a songwriter played by uh, Russ Bagdasarian. Uh, there's a character and, who's so, what's up? Oh, uh, well, who's you know worth pausing here, mentioning uh, you know speaking of Ross Bagdasarian. Yeah. Uh, do you know what do you know what his stage name? was oh david uh, seville dave seville because he create did he create the the he, chipmunks yeah he i know he did a lot of the, the music chipmunks. there you go dave yeah. seville uh, uh we also have um a uh, uh, georgine darcy playing uh, who jeff refers to as miss torso miss torso <laughs> <laughs> um yeah there's uh sarah burner and frank katie uh jesslyn fax or some more of the of the neighbors there's some uh it's it's a really strong cast and what's really special about a lot of these neighbors is that they're really performing as if they're in silent films you know you don't hear their conversations you uh it's, unless they're outside and talking but otherwise you only have to assume what they're experiencing through you know how they're acting with their bodies and their you know their well, body language and miss torso especially with her body well and, and they are presumably like you do see them you don't hear what they're saying right you do see that they're talking so presumably there was scripted dialogue for them that just doesn't this is alfred hitchcock of hurt. course there's yes. scripted you know of course there's a lot more going on that maybe only those actors know about you know that right they're, you know that we just have to we just have to guess um but yeah i mean alfred hitchcock is certainly a a director where like everything is done intentionally there are no accidents everything is very carefully plotted out and uh this is such a really uh compelling movie because of the way that alfred hitchcock you know tells like tells you so much about these characters without the the full on explanations you learn about uh jeff's injuries just by seeing the photos which is weird that he'd have a the photo that he got like <laughs> injured taking you right. know on display in his home but whatever to each their own well he got injured to get that photo and like he I, I, that well, wasn't that good of a photo what's that was it that good of a photo though uh, i i mean you know <laughs> some things are like a car crash that actually was yeah uh, yeah, he so, but the, the, I mean, he has that whole conversation with, I guess, with his editor about, about like, you know, getting that photo and like, you know, he's got that pride, that professional pride that's like no other photographer is going to jump out in the middle of the racetrack, uh, I, I, you know, during a, a, a crash. So, right. Yeah, it, it's, uh, so it's all right. It, I, I, I don't love this movie. I really feel like with with Hitchcock, it's like I'm not a fan of the greatest hits. I like okay. a couple of the it's like uh, Billy Joel for me. It's like I like a couple of the greatest hits, um, it, it, except with Billy Joel. I don't even like the like good greatest hits. I like like, you know, River of Dreams and, and we didn't start the fire. Uh, you like River of Dreams. Okay. Not so much anymore. In I, the I, middle I've, of the night. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've been walking in. The, <laughs> in the, yeah, I mean, uh, like it's well, which kind of relates to the char you know character here because he uh, is up in the middle of the night. He he's not walking in the middle of the night. He's not walking at any time of day no. with his broken leg. Uh, but anyway, no. With with Hitchcock, I feel like with this, with uh, with with this one more so than others like i feel like i when i i like i watch vertigo and like i recognize 
it's the art of it and the accomplishment of it. And there's a lot that I recognize about Rear Window, uh, you know, just the construction of the whole set and the direction of all those other people. Well, there's there's something. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. You, you can oh, keep going. But yeah, I just don't. I'm like. It's really not that I'm like, I'm, I don't know. I, I feel like maybe it would be different if I saw it at the time in a theater, but I'm just not that compelled by it. Rear window. He's just not that into you. <laughs> I'm, so, uh, I'm not, I, okay. I get, I get um, that. I do appreciate uh, the, the structure of the movie. There's, I will say, I, uh, I feel similarly about Jimmy Stewart's character in uh, uh, Rear Window as I do in Vertigo, which is just like, I don't like these guys. He's a tool. He's, yeah. you know, I mean, I know that we're like, we were all like, oh, well, blah, 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 Tom Hanks, Jimmy Stewart. But like, uh, uh, Tom Hanks didn't start trying to be that unlikable in movies until like recently. So. Jimmy Stewart is just, like he reminds me of like cranky old Harrison Ford. <laughs> Interesting you mention Harrison Ford. Dan, what do you think I was doing right before we recorded? Um I'll give uh, you a hint and it's four words long. Get off my plane. Oh, nice. I was like, I want to watch Air Force One, uh, because I love watching Harrison Ford movies where I feel like he's enjoying himself being there yes. and that he's trying really hard because I've been watching the show Shrinking recently on Apple TV Plus uh, where I feel like he's really doing good acting. Like he really, you can tell that he really loves being part of this show. And uh, I, it's been making me want to go back and watch other Harrison Ford movies. And I would put The Fugitive into this category. That's one where I could, I feel like he really yes. is into the performance. Uh, I watched his two Jack Ryan films because uh, I feel like those, oh, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, Patriot Games and Clear and Present Danger, I feel like he was feeling really into being there. I wouldn't say that about any of really the Star Wars movies uh, or, I mean... Yes, Indiana Jones in, in, in three out of the four of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I feel like uh, he he seems to have enjoyed working on this latest one. So I, I was going to say that. Yeah. I, I mean, and, yeah, yeah. I, I think that late, lately he's been getting more into acting. You know, I've, there's so many Harrison Ford movies where there are ones that's like six days, seven nights where I'm just like, he doesn't want to be here. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So okay, that was a that was a whole side thing. Go anyway, on. Anyway, yeah, no, but but it's worth mentioning, and I agree. And that's more of who James Stewart reminds me of in this. And I, I guess some things that I just get distracted by, or it's like he's a total like douche. And Grace Kelly, he is not good to her. Is just, but and she's like perfect. And I know, like, that's part of the problem there. And he's like, oh, you're just, you're too perfect. And, well, oh, you're you not going to want to go on adventures with me. Here, okay, I am going to, uh, I'm going to counter that. I think that we are supposed to think that she's perfect. But she clearly isn't because she's harping after a man who is not respecting her. And okay, yeah. uh, it's it it makes me wonder. And I realize that, you know, in the 50s, uh, you know, people weren't seeing therapists or reading self-help books and stuff like that the way that they are now. But I would say that that character clearly has some issues where she's seeking validation from somebody that is very withholding and yes. is extremely unwilling to give that to her. And so it makes you wonder, like, you know, what is her story? Like, what is going on with this woman who, you know, yes, she's beautiful. She's successful. I uh, even he acknowledges that she could be going out with any other guy. But for some reason, he's the one that she wants to be with. 
And it it really makes you wonder, like, what is it about this guy who just negs her all day long and is just mean to her? It seems to me it's like another one of these, like, Hitchcock proxies where he's like, I want to treat beautiful blonde women like shit. Yeah. So I'm just going to have these characters do it for me. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know enough about Alfred Hitchcock's personal life and the, the people that maybe have come in and out of his life that would be informing those, you know, moves for these characters. Um, did did he write this? Screenplay was by John Michael Hayes, and yeah. it was based on It Had to Be Murder, uh, which was a, I believe that it was actually based on a real murder, but was kind of, you know, dramatized. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I I do wonder how much is in the original screenplay and how much is inserted by Alfred Hitchcock. Certainly the casting, you know. yeah likely is uh very much under his supervision and yeah i i like this movie because i i recognize what it's what it's led to like what kind of uh you know movies have come from films like rear window and great episodes of things like the simpsons <laughs> you know i uh, it's why i love cape fear so much but i uh, there's <laughs> there's so much more to uh, rear window than just you know this unlikable guy and this woman who's seeking validation from him and i the the fun stories sorry my dog's face is getting in between mine and the microphone Mm -hmm. uh yeah and and these these people's stories that he's trying to to demonstrate i i do appreciate the way that he has really, you know, conducted this orchestra of people and their yeah. lives in such a way that, you know, the, you know, Miss Lonely Hearts, who's kind of going through her own depression and, you know, also seeking validation from men, uh, you know, first built up in, in her head. And then the reality, and this is all just from what we see through a window, uh, the reality doesn't match up to it. And she seems to be attempting to take her own life and then you know we we assume all of these things about miss torso and these men that are in her home and then we find out later that you know her heart really belongs to this nebbishy little guy who is you know in the military and you know that's just a really fascinating way that we are led on this journey by alfred hitchcock and it's not just the main storylines that really uh tell a full story about this this neighborhood yeah no it's a very uh like yeah in that respect it's it's really it's interesting it's it's interesting but it's uh, you know what we're we haven't talked at all really about the (laughs) thorwalds well i honestly you know who cares? Right. <laughs> I know that it's like the plot of the movie, but it's, but it's also the, like to me, it's most... the least interesting part of the movie. <laughs> but also, but there's like no suspense in the movie until really, I guess until I guess until the end. But there's I just don't find anything suspenseful, and even the moments where you start to like the sequence where he keeps like nodding off in the chair and waking yeah. up and nodding, off, you know. I, it builds up interestingly, but then there's like, there's just no follow through. And yeah, I, I I think that just frustrates me. I think it's what frustrates me about a lot of Hitchcock is that I'm expecting more suspense and intrigue. And in, in many of the films where I'm expecting it the most, I don't get it. I get it in films like The Man Who Knew Too Much, uh-huh. which, uh, you know, which I just kind of like, you know, put on on a whim. I feel like it's kind of a, you know, B level uh, Hitchcock compared to you know the Psychos and Vertigos and North by Northwest, which I love. Right, uh, right. 
Yeah, but that one's also kind of a, you know, outlier in in the Hitchcock canon. But like I um a torn curtain Torn, well, torn curtain was great for me. If I may interject, mm-hmm. I really feel like the the things that I appreciate most about Alfred Hitchcock's movies uh, are the set pieces and the you know the locations that he chooses to use. They really stick out to me uh, visually. They're the things that. I come back to the most about his films. And what's interesting about Rear Window is that it really only takes place in this one spot, whereas something like North by Northwest really takes you across the country. And, uh, you know, Vertigo takes you all over San Francisco. And there's these iconic set pieces in the, you know, the the tower and, yeah. and all these things where it's, uh, you know, it takes you on these journeys. And it, there are such memorable moments that kind of just bring you in and when you think about the movies i uh, for me at least you know i think about these locations and set pieces more than i do the plots because i mean i remember that north by northwest north by northwest is a you know mistaken identity situation yeah. um but there's uh, you know, so so much more that I know is going on plot wise, but for me, it's just like I want to watch it to see those set pieces. Right. Well, and interestingly, there's there are those Hitchcock films, but then there are other ones that take place in really in a confined setting. I think about Rope, which is another yeah. one that I really mm-hmm. like. That's set all in in this one apartment, uh, yeah, one New York apartment. Which I have to say, he does those like he does those nice New York apartments really well. I really, I well, feel like Dan, they, this is something. This is something I wanted to ask you about actually. Yeah, and uh, I don't think that it, there's any harm in in doxing your former self, but you used to live in <laughs> Sty Town, and yes. I'm wondering, I, uh, you know, that is a a very large, you know, uh, apartment. I, I don't even know collection of apartment buildings. Comp- yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it's very well known. People know what it is when you're talking about it. And I'm wondering if you had a lot of or, or any kind of like uh, experiences with questionable neighbors where, you know, you're trying to put the pieces together about who somebody is based on these little glimpses that you have of their lives. I know oh. that it wasn't set up in such a way. And I know that at least you haven't told me about any suspected murders happening, but who knows? Oh yeah, no. Oh yeah, no. You oh, you wanted to know about the murders. Um, yeah, I didn't live in that um courtyard. Uh, that was two blocks over. Ooh. So no. Um. Okay. All right. Um. So there was there were the there was the couple in the apartment next to ours, and they lived there. I want to say for the first we we were living there. I think I think they lived there for the first year that we lived there and I think they might have been they might have lived there for who knows how long. But uh if I remember correctly they were like you know older hippie types. Okay. Um and they would have uh very loud sex. And, okay. uh, you know, we would hear it uh, th- through the wall. I don't remember if I ever had to, like, go over there, not because of the sex, but for other, like, noise noise things. But um, I don't know. That's, I think, the closest I can, the closest I can get to it is kind of trying to figure out, like, their deal. I, I don't think there was really anybody else that i i mean i don't know i i just don't yeah and i'm thinking about what i remember of the exterior and it doesn't seem like it lends to being able to see into other people's windows so no like i can't would, imagine there was any anything like that it would have to be like people that you saw frequently like out and around yeah in the elevators or you know in the courtyards there right yeah I mean, we did live, uh, I, I think, 
I don't know if she lived there. I think I think our time there overlapped a little bit, but uh, we did live, I think, on the same floor with uh, Mamie Gummer. Really? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, we there was like mail of hers. Oh. One. Okay. No, I'm. Not, I didn't steal her mail. Uh, I'm not accusing you of stealing her mail. No, you're not. But somebody out there, I'm sure, is listening to it and being like, "Oh, okay, so Dan is is stealing Mamie Gummer's mail." Uh, no, I I forget how it came. In fact, I totally forgot about it until recently when uh, my wife Alicia mentioned it and was like, "Yeah, no, remember when like we used to be neighbors with Meryl Streep's daughter and." I was like, wait, what? Huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. The mail. Right. The mail. Uh, so anyway, but like I wasn't I I really don't think I ever was trying to like put pieces together about people's lives. I don't think I got enough uh, out there. But no, no, no. It's worth uh I mean, you've lived in in apartments and Oh yeah, no, of course. Complexes. I think that there's also a difference between you know, because I lived in apartment buildings in Los Angeles, and in Los Angeles, it's different from a place like New York. Um, I, I don't know. I, there, it's just I, I don't know if it's the you know condensed nature of uh, how many people are really living on one <laughs> one block of you know property, but yeah, yeah, uh. But no, I think that uh, just kind of going back to Rear Window, um, it I really enjoyed revisiting this movie from the st- you know we've talked about this before where it's like you know you watch something and then a few years later you might have a different perspective. You've lived a few years, you've had a few years worth of experiences that may change the way that you view a particular kind of movie. You've seen and- neighbors hiding their wives bodies and cleaning their bone saws yeah <laughs> through the window no but i i think that uh for rear window i watched it with a different eye than i had watched it before and uh, i really focused more on the the story of lisa and jeff and uh, i cared a whole lot less about what jeff was doing and his conspiracy theories and things like that and uh, Honestly, um, not to spoil the ending or anything, but it's I was I'm almost disappointed by the ending. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, hey, if you don't know how Rear Window ends, skip a minute or two. But I, uh, you know, he discovers that yes, this guy did kill his wife and cut up her body and dispose of it in suitcases and stuff. And uh, for me, it would be so much better if. He had just built all this narrative in his head. Right. And uh, there, uh, yeah. And uh, maybe there was something different going on. Maybe he was doing something else that, you know, this exposed him or something. But well, kind of like that- the Burbs, where it's like, well, yes, they were guilty of a murder, not the one that they thought the, the yes. Klopeks were guilty of. Yeah. And I mean, maybe, and maybe that's what makes the burbs. And I know that you have your opinions on the burbs too, but you know, it, the ending is, is fun in a, in a really different way. Um, and, you know, because we're talking about other iterations of rear window, uh, you know, of course we have to talk about the nineties remake with Christopher Reeve. No. Dan, have you seen it? I tried. Okay. I, I tried. watched the whole thing. It is very, feels very made for TV. It feels very 90s made for TV. Um, it's with Christopher Reeve and Daryl Hannah. Um, here, this is the synopsis from Wikipedia. And uh, clearly, this is after Christopher Reeve's accident. And I was really the only appropriate way to have him appear on screen again you know so uh here's here's the synopsis uh quadriplegic jason kemp a former architect who now uses a wheelchair relieves the boredom of his daily existence by engaging in voyeurism a pastime that allows him to spy on his neighbors from the rear window of his apartment 
When he witnesses sculptor Julian Thorpe viciously beat his wife Eileen, he reports the incident to 911 and the police remove him from his home. Thorpe is released the following day, and that night Jason Kemp hears a blood-curdling scream from the courtyard. From that moment on, Eileen is missing from her apartment, apparently replaced by another woman. Jason, certain she was murdered by her husband, tries to convince his colleague Claudia, nurse Antonio, and friend, Char- and friend Charlie that his suspicion is true. Thorpe slowly comes to the realization that Kemp is fully aware of his crime and engages him in a deadly game of cat and mouse in an effort to silence him forever. So, I, uh, you know, it's it's a rear window that is designed to exist in the 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 situation that best suits Christopher Reeves' situation. And I know that there are a lot of elements that were taken directly from Christopher Reeves' experience when he had problems going on with his, you know, machinery and he would like click his teeth for them to know that there was a problem and things like that. But I, I think that as a um, kind of a final send off for the acting career of Christopher Reeve, I'm glad that they did it. It seemed like it was, you know, a, a, a great way for them to do that. I'm glad that it wasn't like a major release or anything. It just felt kind of appropriate. And, you know, I mean, look, Christopher Reeve, he's my Superman, you yes. know, yes. you know, and um, it's it's hard to see him uh, in a position in which he's struggling so much. And, you know, that that's a real thing and yes. not acting. Yes. And yeah. so uh, for that reason, you know, mad respect for Christopher Reeve. Uh, pour one out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I couldn't. I was too uncomfortable just knowing that, like, he really was in that, like, you know, really um, delicate condition. Yeah. Yeah. And and there were some things about it that I also felt uncomfortable with. Like, he had – everyone was, like, assisting him in setting up video cameras to spy on his neighbors. And it was like, seriously? This is – Straight up creepy and very illegal. And pre-Patriot Act. Yes, pre-Patriot Act. Yeah. Um, and Dan, while we're talking about other re-envisions of Rear Window, got to talk about Disturbia. <laughs> have you seen Disturbia? I have not seen Disturbia. Okay. No, I, right off I the bat, not. right off the bat, great name. Yes. it's It's a great name. Also- Great villain, David Morse. Are you kidding me? Uh, Absolutely, yes. Ah, uh, I don't know how I can root against David Morse, especially when when like the protagonist is Shia LaBeouf. I know how you can root against him. He's got a really weird looking earring. Just saying, and he's got like a little curly mullet. It's kind oh, of weird. Yeah, well, David so Morse does an excellent job as the uh, as the villain. So Disturbia, a troubled high school student, becomes convinced he is living next door to a wanted serial killer. Struggling to come to terms with the death of his father, the teen lands himself in hot water after a fight with a teacher and is put under house arrest. During his domestic confinement, he begins to spy on his mysterious neighbor, believing him to be a murderous psychopath on the run from the authorities. And I think that it's a really great conceit. Uh, he's under house arrest. And so he has, you know, the, the ankle monitor. He has like a little perimeter around his house. There's rules that are established. Like if you, if this light goes red and you hear this beep, you have 10 seconds to get back into the territory. Otherwise the cops come like the running man. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, yeah. And, and the cops come right away and the cop who's, you know, um, kind of looking over him is the cousin of the teacher that he like punched that got him under house arrest. Uh, I hate when that happens. Yeah. It's this whole thing. So always uh, ends up being the cousin of the teacher. (laughs) But uh, the actual, like, I don't know if she's a parole officer, what she is, but uh, played by Viola Davis. uh, Oh, who's, who's excellent. Carrie Ann Moss is the, is Shia LaBeouf's mom. Um, it's Shia LaBeouf, but you know, it, honestly, like 
all things considered, it was fine for what it was. Um, but also like kind of a really solid way of bringing back rear window uh, in the aughts. And uh, they, you know, they did it in a way that felt very authentic to, you know, the era and the characters. And nobody mm. was trying to be a Jimmy Stewart you know, it was all very much its own thing, but it's like, oh yeah, this is Rear Window. You know, this is right. kind of like the Burbs also, you know, but it's, you know, taking a little bit of, from here and there. And it, you know, has a yeah. very, what, 2008, maybe is when that was, but that kind of feel. 2007, yeah, it's yeah. exactly that kind of feel. So, yeah. right, yeah. like like just at the dawn of smartphones, Yes, but I don't think that this had any of those. No, because I think those are kind of like game changers for stuff like this. Yeah. Yeah. So tricky. Yeah. So, so Dan, I mean, what would you want to happen with a rear window uh, 2023 situation? Yeah. Well, so, you know, like I said, it it's kind of tricky. Like only murders in the building is you know, possibly doing it the best way that one could do it in a contemporary 2023 setting. Because it involves a podcast? Because it involves a podcast. Um, uh, I just, it's kind of like, how do you do Rear Window without doing Rear Window? And, like, that's kind of it. Uh... So I, I just don't know about setting this story. Like you need to set it in a time where someone's boredom. Cause part of the, like the whole thing is you need to have that sense that, Oh, this person is so like bored and lonely that they're coming, that they could very well be coming, like ma making this stuff up. So yeah. just, just like with the burbs and, and with rear window and, you know, you kind of are wondering the whole time, like, all right, is, is I don't know that he's right about this. So I think you would need to set it in a in a time when just you would have more boredom and there wouldn't be so much, uh, you know, other stuff to do. So, like, I was thinking a mid 90s set remake and I was thinking of it on a college campus Okay. You have an athlete who's who's injured, you know, student student athlete who's uh who's injured and they are you know, they just spend a lot of time, you know, sitting by their whatever dorm room window and they you know, they they <laughs> they, they, they look out on the quad. They see people's they... patterns. They notice patterns. They're looking out onto the quad. Yeah, and they're noticing. They're like, you "There's know, somebody oh. missing from that drum circle that's usually there." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, huh? That guy usually plays hacky sack with somebody else, hmm. and that's also like I think the 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 fun of it is you could you, you could uh potentially be much like sing streak is able to be 90s without you know or be, be 80s without over being being too gimmicky you could be 90s without being too 90s because you are on a 90s college campus so like there would be a hacky sack circle there would hmm. be devil sticks there would That's be devil the sign sticks. of there, that's evil that's, right there. Oh, the, the mark yeah. of the devil, the six of the devil. I am. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, anyway, I'm seeing. How have uh, devil sticks not come back? I, because we have not <laughs> brought them back. That is. Oh, much. okay. Uh, but hey, I always, I had fun with some devil sticks back in the day. I could see you doing very poor devil sticking. No, 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 no. Not poor devil sticking. Oh. I was fairly good at devil okay. sticking. Okay. Okay. All right. Like, I, don't, I never got that into it. So, like, I don't think I could really do tricks. Okay. But, um, no, you know, I knew my way around a devil stick. So. Okay. De yeah. So, you know. Uh, but that's, uh, I think that's that's what I'm seeing. That's what I would do. What's your. Uh, okay. What's your idea? What's your pitch? Well, Dan, there's one thing that we didn't talk about when we were discussing Rear Window, and that is the fact that 
a dog has been murdered. And oh, yeah. as we all know, it is more upsetting when a dog is killed than when a human is killed. This is true. And so I would love to see a version of this that is solely focused on this dog. Because there are so many people that could be suspects. I'm not saying necessarily the exact characters from Rear Window, but... So you want to see the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime? I'm pausing on the purpose. Cur- the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime... Is that a book? Is a book that has been adapted into a play, and it's... Uh, actually yeah so and it's told from the perspective of a boy with autism i believe he he's like 11 or 12 and uh his neighbor's dog is 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 found dead uh buried in like in the yard like stabbed with a fork i think is i think is how it is so and the boy just becomes fascinated with this and like, why would someone want to murder my neighbor's dog? And what would make them do this? And what are the, and he starts to kind of solve the murder. Okay. Well, you know, that's one, I know it's that's not one exactly approach. I know I just, <laughs> it's, it's, it is, you could do this differently, but it, that's so what it made I, me think of. And I highly recommend it. It's a brilliant book. Oh, Okay. I, I've I've heard of it, but I yeah, well now I know more about it than I did before. There you go. Uh yeah, no, I think that there's something to be done with the the murder of this dog. Perhaps it is even uh it even happens in order to distract people so that a murder of a human can take place. Perhaps something maybe other some other kind of crime that is just there to, you know, distract people. Um but that's really what I'd like to see. Uh, I do not think it could take place in the age of ring cameras, um, unless it is city based, where people probably don't have them uh, in the courtyard of a you know series of buildings in a city. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But uh, I th- and I am not condoning, you know, any story that involves the the murder of a dog. I. Uh, but I think it'd be a more compelling story than a person getting killed. And then you'd spin that one off by rebooting All Dogs Go to Heaven. Sure. But that's not what we're doing on our next episode. Dan, do you want to tell people what no. we're doing on our next episode? <laughs> yes, our next episode, something uh, totally different, uh, is 1980s 9 to 5. That's right. It's Dolly Parton, Jane Fonda, Lily Tomlin, and Dabney Coleman. Dean Coles, love a it. A quintessential '80s comedy with a phenomenal theme song, one of the greatest all time, uh, and, and a and a lead cast that is still active and absolutely killing it today. Yes, I mean, who doesn't love... 80 for Brady in theaters now. Okay, yeah, no, but I mean, seriously, it's like, first of all, who doesn't love Dolly Parton? And I mean, we'll talk about... We're all, I'm going to yeah. save that. We'll talk about it next time. But you heard it, 9 to 5. Uh, on our next episode, I don't. whenever that can happen, it will be 9 to 5. Yeah, and if you have any thoughts about Rear Window, 9 to 5, or any other movie that we've talked about, please email us at ruinedchildhoodspot at gmail.com. Uh, in the episode's description, you'll find our link tree that also has a link to our online store for cool merch. And uh, yeah, I, Dan, I'm really excited to have an opportunity to watch 9 to 5 again. I uh, you know, we're we're traveling through time from the 50s to to the early 80s, which is exciting. Yes. Uh, and Dan, as as you uh, are being photographed in a car crash that that uh, l- l- sends a guy, I don't know, have a good journey. Good journey.